It's interesting when I heard Pastor Emmanuel um, pray for the elections, it reminded me of an experience I had with the Lord not long ago. Uh, we, my history, I was born in West Texas in El Paso, grew up in Galveston, we moved to Oklahoma when I was in high school, met my wife in high school in Oklahoma. Um, we got married between junior and senior year in college, went to the Army, it was Vietnam, and then uh, we moved to Seattle, Washington, and we were there for 35 years until uh, two years ago in, in 2019, the, my oldest daughter has a special needs son in Washington State. She's looking on the internet and says, oh, look here, McKinney, Texas. Um, they're number five, top five in the nation at serving special needs kids. Let's go check it out. Would you go with us? So we went to, rented a vacation by rental home in McKinney. And in the meantime, uh, they went to visit a pastor friend because she, she and her husband, my son-in-law, pastor a church in Seattle. And uh, I went to prayer walk around the city late. And when I'm prayer walking around the city late, listening to preaching, uh, the Lord begins to speak to me. You know, I'm giving you the city. I'm giving you the city. I'm giving you the city. Well, what does that mean? Um, I didn't. I never found out what it meant, but uh, I did find out that he wanted us to transition and move here. So two years ago, uh, God created everything. We moved our family, we moved our business. Um, he found us a home that was a tremendous blessing. The way that he set it up was just miraculous. Um, there was this one house that was about $100,000 higher than all the other houses around it. And my wife said, oh, well, let's look at that house. I said, no, it's just a bad, it's been on the market forever because it's overpriced. I don't want to know, you know, it's not going to be good. It's not a good deal. And so uh, we, were, we were staying in an Airbnb, renting an Airbnb. And every house we would look at and make an offer on, we'd get blown out in bidding wars and I'm not going to pay some crazy price because it's just a house. And uh, finally, uh, we made an offer on a house in North McKinney and they countered it back, but then by the time we could fix everything that was in it, it was going to cost more than the house that was priced that I didn't want to look at because it was too high. So we finally went and looked at it. It had everything that we wanted. So we made a lowball offer. They took the lowball offer on the first day. And then uh, we did, you know, had the inspection, and there was three pages worth of things that needed to be fixed. You know, when you buy houses, you've got to do an inspection. Three pages. And um, uh, the real estate agent says, oh, well, this is a very hot market. You can't ask for any more than three things to be fixed because they'll blow up the deal. So we asked for seven. They said yes to all seven. And then they took the inspection report and they fixed one third of the things that were on the inspection report that they didn't have to pay for. Mm. Uh, and then we moved in. We moved into the house, closed the deal, moved into the house, made a payment, you know, one mortgage payment. And oh, in the meantime, while we were going through all of this, the interest rates kept dropping, mm -hmm. got a veteran's loan for no money down, uh, moved in uh, to the home in McKinney that was the same size as the house that we had um, lived in in Seattle, only uh, the one in Seattle was three times the price of the one in McKinney. <laughs> and we were leasing that. And we were going to, you know, the seller who was a landlord, offered to either renew the lease or sell it to us and sell it to us for market price, which is three times the price that we moved in. So when the Lord tells you, I'm giving you this city, yep. go, go. So in the meantime, you might, uh, Pastor Emmanuel reminded me, talk, talking about praying for elections, uh, when I first would come to visit McKinney and we were just looking at houses, I, I was, uh, our company was doing a project for Toyota in Puerto Rico. Um, our, uh, we do, uh, our business is a stealth ministry. Uh, we do corporate transformation for uh, everything from small businesses to our largest client is Toyota. We've served them for 35 years. Our process is biblically based, but it's also very sound science and great psychology. So it works very well whether it's a Christian organization or not. Uh, believers who are there are recognized, you know, that it's biblically based and 
unbelievers just recognize that it's good material and it works and our, our clients get great returns on their investments. So um, I'm coming down here because as a Staffa point because we're doing a project for the uh, to, uh, Puerto Rican Toyota bit, uh, division in Puerto Rico. And I stopped in Dallas and met with a pastor who's a friend of my son-in-law and I'm prayer walking around McKinney again in a different part of the town. And while I'm prayer walking, the Lord says, <clears throat> I'm, pr I'm praying for government leaders. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to pray for government leaders. And I'm praying my standard prayer, you know, Lord, forgive them for all the stupid stuff that they're doing. <laughs> you know, uh, you know the, kind of the same prayer that Emmanuel prayed. And it just occurred to me that while I'm walking, you know, and I, you, you know, and like if you're exercising or you're walking, the endorphins are higher and you're getting good to work out and you can feel the spirit and you can hear God easier. And the Lord says, uh, and it just occurred to me that, you know, he wasn't answering my prayers on these, you know, you know, pray for government leaders prayers. So I asked him, you know, I said, well, what's the right prayer? What do you want me to pray for? He <clears throat> says, I want you to pray that I will remove every unrighteous leader from office and replace them with righteous leaders who hear my voice and obey. So uh, you know what Second uh, Second Chronicles seven fourteen says? That's when God was speaking to Solomon, and he says the prayer. You know, if you humble yourself and you know repent of your sins and you know uh, pray, then I'll forgive your sins and heal your nation. So I set my phone for seven fourteen every morning and seven fourteen every evening, and every time it goes off, I just thank the Lord for removing every single unrighteous leader from office and replacing them with righteous leaders. There's got to be others. You know, there's got to be others that are praying, not for this party or that party, but that that he put righteous leaders in office who hear his voice and obey. Mm. Hear his voice is a very important part, I found, of my relationship with God. Yes. Most Christians don't believe that when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, my sheep know my voice, the voice of a stranger they shall not follow, because my sheep moan by voice. If you're a sheep, then either Jesus was kidding, or he was lying, or we're supposed to hear his voice. So uh, years ago, I grew up in a um, traditional Roman Catholic family who lived their faith. Um, I believed in God. You know, I knew who Jesus was. I knew what he did for me. I went to Catholic schools from kindergarten through high school. And I prayed, and God answered my prayers, prayed my way through college. They weren't even scriptural prayers, I found later, but he answered them. <laughs> anyway. And so, um, when I got out of the army, and I was a young man working in the family business, I began, my dad was a football coach and a teacher, and he owned, a, had a business, a car business, and was always bringing in teachers and coaches to train us and develop us. So I went to one program, and I learned how to, how important it was to set goals in all areas of your life, not just your business or your finances, but also my spiritual goal was to find a church that I could, I could relate to because I thought the church that what I was in was just dry and boring. And then uh, the next training program was on the psychology of achievement. It was about how to achieve goals. So I had all these goals that I set, including my spiritual goal was to find a church to relate to. And then I learned about, you know, the importance of, of writing goals, of speaking them, of uh, imagining them, of praying over them, how to pray over them, how to seek God for wisdom on goals. And so I'm doing that. And one thing led to another. The first thing that happened was it occurred to me that the problem wasn't with the church. The problem was with me because I was a taker instead of a giver. And I was looking for what can I get from the church instead of what can I give to the church. And so, you know, I started giving, and, you know, things began to change. Giving of time, giving of treasure, giving of talent, started giving. Uh, and then one of the, I had two sales people that worked for me that were my top sales people. One was a, a young, you know, beautiful young man from Georgia. He was a um, born-again Christian. And everybody knew it, and he was our top salesman. Everybody loved him. People bought cars from him all the time. 
Um, the other one was a, a, a rough and tough Italian kid from the Bronx, New York. Um, we called him Catfish because he was the closer. And he was, you know, he was a scavenger. He would always come in and, you know, abuse people until they would finally buy a car. Uh, and and they would, you know, they would buy it just to get away from him, <laughs> just to get away from it. It was bad. And so one day, uh, the young young guy comes in and says, Steve, I quit. And I said, well, why'd you quit? Why are you quitting? You can't quit. You're my best salesman. He says, I quit because the Lord spoke to me and told me that I needed to move back to Georgia. And I said, well... God doesn't speak to people today, and if, beside, if he did, he wouldn't tell you to leave. You're my best salesman. You can't leave. And I couldn't persuade him, so he moves back to Georgia. Two weeks later, the kid from the Bronx comes and says, Steve, I quit. I said, you can't quit. You're our best closer. Why are you quitting? He says, well, the Lord spoke to me. I said, wait a minute, Al. You don't even believe in God. And I said, if you did, he would never speak to you. And besides, God doesn't speak to people today. And if he did, he would never speak to you because you're a bad man. <laughs> you're a bad man. And he says, well, I didn't used to believe, but I went to this meeting with the other guy. And he says, there was this woman who had one leg that was this much shorter than the other. And all these people gathered around her, put their hands on her, started speaking in the same language, and I watched her leg grow up this far before my very eyes. So we saw a legitimate miracle. That was a full gospel business meeting, by the way. Mm. I found out later. And so his eyes were this big. He says, I didn't used to believe in God, but I really believe now, and I believe the Lord told me to leave here and go work in the insurance. So he left. So in the meantime, so I keep working on my goals. I achieve my, oh, and on the way out, he gives me this little, it was called Good News for Modern Man, the New Living... New Testament, New Living Translation back in the day. Tattered, beat up, you know, been worn out. And so I start, set another goal, read one chapter a day. I'm reading chapter, 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 uh, finding out, I wanted to find out not just, um, I wanted to find out what I believed. And so I get to the camel going through the eye of the needle, and I really get convicted, because I wanted to be rich and successful bad. And the way I understood that was, if you're if if you if you're rich and successful, then you, you can't get into heaven. And the nuns in my Catholic school painted a bit vision of hell that you wouldn't want to get any any place near. So I got very very internally distressed, just you know anxiety and frustration, and you know couldn't get what couldn't get rid of it. it was like depression and anxiety. And so I was just angry, and I was just, you know, trying to get out of this. And so I'm praying, and I'm seeking God, and I'm looking for signs in the clouds. And, I mean, no signs in the clouds. So finally, it occurred to me that I had this thought in my mind that if I ever totally surrendered to the Lord, he would send me to Africa to live in a mud hut to be a missionary. And um, I screamed at God, and I said, Even a mud hut is better than this. I'll take the stupid mud hut. And I heard the still small voice for the first time in my life. And he was laughing hilariously. And it was like belly laughing hilariously. Just laughter, laughter, laughter. And I said, well, what's so funny? He said, you think I'm so stupid that I would send somebody with your gifts and talents to be a missionary in Africa? I got mud hut people for Africa. I want you right where you are. And then he showed me a scripture in the epistles where Paul said the same thing and confirmed it. And then the, the minute I said that, all of the anxiety left. It was like it vaporized, it appears. So I didn't know what happened. So I, you know, I, the only spiritual man I knew was a president of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for the state of Oklahoma. And we would used to give cars to his missionaries, the young athletes that would go. So, so I called and I told him what happened. He says, well, Steve, you got saved. And I said, what's that? And he explained it to me. He explained it to me. And I went home and I told my wife, and she says, well, weren't you always? And I said, no. So we talked more, and we found out the difference between her and me was she had the praying nuns in Oklahoma, and I had the ruler-slapping nuns in Texas. Because, I mean, she had a relationship with the Lord from the time that she was in kindergarten. And so then, you know, I really started getting into the Word, and I took... My wife had this, you know, someone gave her um, this, one of those little leather, you know, imitation leather-bound Bibles with a flap on it, and you snap it. 
And, um, you know, uh, she was reading an Amplified Bible, and it was like a New King James or something. So I got it, and I would take it to work with me every day, and I used to ride the bus to work. And uh, every place it said in Christ, or every promise that was in that Bible, I would write my name. I got in trouble because I wrote all over her Bible. You know, I wrote in it. And she said, well, that's just your Bible. Now you, you can have it. And it had her name on the front of it. But every single one, I highlighted every promise, I wrote my name in it, and then every day I would review that, and every, every prom I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wealth and riches are in my house because I'm the righteousness of Christ. I know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because though he was rich for my sake, he became poor that I through his poverty am rich in all things. And I said him again and again and again and again for months and 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 months. And, months. and I would read more and I would highlight it and write my name in it. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. <clears throat> so, um, time went on. You know, our business prospered. Um, we had a marriage crisis uh, and we moved to Seattle. Well, that, there was one more piece. Uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes guy uh, you know, I was in the Word now, and I mean, I was reading every every scripture, and I was claiming them, and they were mine, and this belongs to me, and I found the gifts of the Spirit, so I took those, and I had manifestations of all nine gifts of the Spirit. You know, I prayed for a Catholic priest, and God healed him of a heart surgery, didn't have to have heart surgery. Uh, you know, every, all nine gifts of the Spirit, every all of them, you know, and so Coach, Coach when I told him this, and he goes like, he goes like this. <laughs> You know, well, Steve, that's, so he thought I was really getting off track. You know, that stuff's not for today. Well, it says it right here. It says it right here. It says it right here. Uh, that's, that's not for today. So uh, he introduces me to this head, you know, Dr. Bill Stewart, white hair, uh, retired Baptist pastor, theologian. And, he, you know, to, to straighten me out. And so uh, it ended up that we sold our home in Oklahoma City, and we uh, m m were looking for a house, didn't know if we were going to move or not, because by then I'd gotten into the coaching and consulting business, and my partner was in Seattle. And we rented Coach's house because he couldn't sell it, and he's right across the street from Dr. Stewart. So, and this, this guy, I mean, he really knew the word. He, he had so much faith. And so he's out, you know, I'm running, you know, I was running then, I walk now, but I'm running, and I would run around the neighborhood in the middle of the day, you know, I believe that if you ran in the heat, you would sweat more, and that was better for you, because my dad was a football coach in the Lombardi era, and we knew that there was no game without pain. Not in the Bible, but, you know, it, it's, 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 someone said it. And so, I'd be running, listening to preaching tapes, and Dr. Stewart would be out mowing his lawn with a safari hat on, African safari hat, you know, like one of those hunters. And then, and I waved at him, come around the block again, and now, no lawnmower's running, no Dr. Stewart. Uh, I go over there, and he's laying on the ground, on his back, spread eagle, his hat, the, the safari hat's over there, lawnmower's running. Now, are you okay? And he says, well... He says, I just had a heart attack, but the Lord's healing me. Finish your run. And I said, wait a minute. Don't you want me to call an ambulance or 911? He says, Steve, the Lord's healing me. Finish your run. Mm. Round the block again, there's Dr. Stewart up mowing his lawn again. All right. So this was my mentor that God brought into my life. So like a week later, I'm running again, and a still small voice says, take him a check for $500. Took it in, knock on the door. His little wife, Melka, she's about four foot three. She answers the door, must be 80 years old, and I'm like in my 20s. And uh, I said, I think the Lord wanted me to bring you this check. And her eyes get this big. And she says, oh, wait, wait right here. Bill, 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 wait, you know, she calls, you know, she says, wait right here. And he was down in the basement working. She called him up. They took me inside, sat down at the table, and they began to tell me that because he didn't have a retirement as a pastor, he made his living by preaching, recording messages for radio, and then would send them to the radio station, 
And she said, last night we needed $500 to pay our radio bill, and we prayed and asked the Lord to send it to us. And this is you. Mm-hmm. And then they began to teach me, whenever you pray or pray like pray, or pray, pray a prayer like that, you never tell anybody. Because you don't want the flesh. Mm-hmm. You know, you want the Lord. And so as time went on, you know, we ended up moving to Seattle because my senior partner was there. Our business thrived and prospered. Had a marriage crisis when I was like late 30s. We had two children, two teenagers, daughter and a son. And um, I don't know what's wrong. So I'm running five miles, 10 miles, and I'm thanking the Lord for healing my marriage with every strike. We went to a marriage counselor. We were counseling the counselor. We knew more than the counselor did. And thanking the Lord, thanks for healing my marriage. Thank you every stride, every stride. Running 10 miles, five miles. I come home one day, beautiful sunny day in Lake, around Lake Washington in Seattle. And my wife's standing at the front door and she has that look in her eye like, oh no, I did it again. I did it again. What did I do this time? So I'm, you know, she says, we need to talk. And we're going up the stairs. And... Um, and I'm praying all the way up the stairs. Lord, please let me say the right thing. Don't let me step on my tongue again. Um, and we get her in the bedroom. She closes the door. And all of a sudden, I realized how unhappy she was. She looked so unhappy. And what blew out of my mouth, I, it just had to be God because I didn't know what I was going to say, was, I can't believe how unhappy you are. Uh, you deserve to be happy. If it will make you happy, uh, I will move out and take my addiction to achievement with me. And support you and the kids for the rest of your life and she broke and began to cry and shared that she and the two kids had had a meeting the week before and decided they were going to fire me that week and she was going to tourney shopping so she didn't fire me because i repented you know and the lord restored our marriage but in the process she shared that she all, she wanted more children, and we had two, and I'd already had the surgery, and we talked about it and agreed two was plenty. They were good kids, good students, good athletes. And uh, she, I think she realized, because my daughter was 15, she was dating a uh, young man who had three, two brothers who had been abandoned by their mother and raised by their father. And so they would spend more time at our house than they would at theirs because we had a family. And I think she realized that she had more to give as a mom uh, by encouraging and mentoring these three teenage boys. And so she says, you know, says, well, you know, I, I want more children. I've always wanted more children. I says, no, you haven't. You never told me. She says, well, I just realize it now. You know, I want more children. So I called up a friend in children's services. You got any of those orphans we can check out for the holidays? He says, there are no more orphans. There's only foster children. And, I mean, you have to go, you have to go, for six weeks to get licensed as a foster parent. Uh, But we've got an orientation in January. It's free. Why don't you come? So we went. We learned things about raising kids. We wish we would have known about our kids when we were raising them because they were 8th grade and I think 10th grade then, ninth grade or 10th grade. And we we took a placement. They gave us a two-month-old baby girl, infant girl, whose mother was American Caucasian. Her dad was Iranian Muslim, and she was afraid he was going to kill the baby because she was a girl, so she put the baby in foster care. And a little uh, Michael Quincy Brown, little African-American kid, really cute, 18-month-old. His mom got pregnant in high school. Their parents disowned her, and so she put him in foster care, you know, choir, I, uh, so she could finish high school. So we kept these kids for six months, fell in love with them, took care of them, raised them. Our kids fell in love with them. And then their parents went to counseling, put their stuff together. And when they took the parents, parents took the kids back, it broke our hearts. Uh, so we kept... The next two and adopted them and then the mother of those two delivered another baby in jail and left him with a guy on the bus and my wife believed that we should keep all of the siblings together so we got that one and that was three plus our two was five anyway um, seven adoptions later we have nine including our two Business is good, making a million bucks a a year, living in a 17,000 square foot house on 32 acres, driving a Jaguar convertible and a Lexus SUV and got a F-150 just for the weekends to do the garden truck, brand new F-150 with all the stuff on it. 
going to the big mega church, serving on the board of directors. Pastor brags about how we're the biggest giver in the congregation and just rocking right along. And then all of a sudden, my income goes from $85,000 a month to 20000 to nothing. The tow truck is circling the house. And, and the other tow truck already has a hook on the 15-passenger customized van, which was the only vehicle we had that could hold all the kids to take them to church because we were up to 11 by then. And, uh, and the only word I can hear from God for 10 years is, son, you know very well who you are in me. Now it's time for you to learn who I am that's within you. 10 years of getting sucked through the keyhole but first. You've been sucked through the keyhole, butt first, and then every time I would get get through, and praise God, and you know the the bank suing us for 1.6 million dollars, and you know the IRS is chasing us, and the tow truck circling everything. Every time I'd get through on the other side, and praise God, I'd hear that that sucking sound again, <laughs> and it was time to go back again. And uh, realized that all I had done was activate the promises of God on my behalf to become prideful and arrogant and look down on everybody else who wasn't as yeah. successful yeah. as I yeah. thought I was. God doesn't like pride. But anyway, so he rescued me. And when we'd had like seven adopted children, we were exhausted. You know, living in the house, couldn't afford it. 17,000 square feet indoor swimming pool, 32 acres, couldn't afford it. Tow truck circling the house, fighting with lawyers, the IRS, everybody wanted to get us, everybody wanted a piece. So I get this invitation from this ministry that I never heard of, Isaiah 58 Ministries. Come to this Christian business consultation in Colorado Springs. Threw it away. I'm busy. Threw it away. Next week, I'm in San Francisco doing a pro bono workshop for a pastor who has an animation business, and he has four very noteworthy guests who come to the workshop. Uh, one of them, remember Nora Lam, the evangelist from China? They made a movie, China Cry, about her life. So one of them was her assistant. Another one was a Ugandan consultant at the World Bank from Uganda. Another one was a... a architect who just finished building a home on the Stanford campus for the founder of Hewlett Packard's daughter. Another one was a Silicon Valley marketing consultant. And all of these people are prevailing on me. Aren't you going to this event the next week in Colorado Springs? No, I'm busy. I've got stuff going on. Besides, I don't even know who they are. So at the break, I called my office. My assistant says, something weird just happened. Every appointment you had next week canceled. Except the one trip to Washington, D.C. you don't want to take. I call my wife. She says, well, this, this could be God. You should go. So in the meantime, we got seven special needs kids. We're buying, you know, plus our two. We're buying diapers at Costco, four cases at a time. I have no, we only afforded them by the grace of God. Different sizes, four cases at a time. Three rotating nannies on shifts just to survive. And... Uh, we go to buy a rocking recliner for the nursery and we sit down on the recliners in the furniture store. Both of us fell asleep in the furniture store and the salesman had to come wake us up. We were exhausted. We were up all night long, you know, we had two five-month-old twin girls living in our room, in our bedroom. The salesman says, you can't sleep here and so we bought one out of guilt <laughs> and made a promise. No more kids. That's it. You know, God be our witness. No more kids. So I'm in San Francisco. My wife says, well, you should go to this. This could be God. So I go to the meeting. And the way the meeting happened was there were two, three, two business guys and a bishop to the Indonesian church in L.A. One was an attorney. One was a real estate broker from Minnesota. And they were at the Ed Savoso City Reachers meeting in Argentina. They got into the same cab together. 
and realized that all three had the same prophetic dream on the same night, that God was moving out of the church into the marketplace and going to begin to do ministry through businesses. And they didn't know what it was, so they prayed about it for a whole year, once an hour a week together on the phone, until they decided, well, maybe if, if this really is God, we'll have a conference and 30 people might show up. Well, 99 people came from all over the world. So I go there, and it's this you know, very powerful meeting, a lot of prophetic people. And there was this one lady who says, stops in the middle of her message. She says, I've, you know, the Lord has a word for all of you business people. He wants you to take all your money, you know, your, your credit card, your wallets, your jewelry, anything that symbolizes wealth and put it in a pile in the middle of the floor. I thought, this is the sleaziest way to take up an offering I ever heard. Uh, but, but the presence of God was so thick in this meeting that everybody did it. I mean, there's like belt buckles and Rolex watches. And, and she says, the Lord says that you all give him your money, but he doesn't want your money. He wants your time. Most of you spend more time in the gym working out than you do in the presence of God and in prayer and in the word. And if you'll give the Lord a tithe of your time, he wants your time, not your money, a tithe of your time for the next year, he'll change your whole life from your own after. So, I mean, I would listen to anything then because the tow truck was circling the house. It was already on the, on the van. You know, I needed healing in my body and I couldn't get it. And so, took a whole day, every week, told my assistant, no appointments, and would just go. We had a home in not far away in the islands uh, around Seattle, and I would go and just seek the Lord all day long, you know, for a year. And as time went on, you know, he began to break us out of our trouble, you know, one step at a time, all miraculous. And, but when I was at that meeting back in Colorado Springs, it was over, and I, I, my cell wouldn't work in the building, so I borrowed a landline, and there's a pastor who was in the meeting who was using the landline in front of me because his cell wouldn't work either. And so I clear my voicemail, he sits around and he says, uh, he waits until I finish and he says, hi, Steve, uh, I'm Pastor Rich. Uh, we're, we have a church in San Jose, California. We have um, a maternity home. Last week, a pregnant alcoholic crack addict came in. She's going to deliver this baby any day. The baby will obviously be drug and alcohol affected. I heard you took kids like this. We need parents. Would you take this child? And I said, oh, no. <laughs> and I said, well, you better let me talk to my wife. And in my heart, I'm saying, God, no more. No, I can't, we can't do anymore. I mean, it's, it's, can't go through the keyhole ass first again. And I said ass. You know, I can't, I can't do, God understands ass. It's in the Bible, you know. <laughs> Even had an ass speak one time. One time. I can't do, I can't do this again. And so I tell my wife, and she says, well, you better let me pray. Next day, I call back, she says, I really feel like the Lord's telling us to take this child. He's going to be a boy. He's going to have red hair, and we're to name him Christopher David because it means bearer of the anointed one, burning up with love for God. And I said, what kind of pizza did you have for dinner? You know, nobody hears from God that clearly. And she says, I just feel this is it. This is just the Lord. This is just the Lord. Can't you just call him and find out more about it? You know, no. We said, we promised. We made a deal. No, and she won't leave me alone. She's relentless. So finally, on Saturday morning, I send the pastor an email. You know, all I said was, Pastor, can you tell me any more information about this child that's going to be born? That's it. Saturday morning, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I get a voicemail. Oh, hi, Steve. This is Pastor Rich. Got your email. It's a long weekend. Sorry. Oh, the baby was born on Sunday night. Cute little guy. We took him to the hospital. He's miraculously drug and alcohol free. The doctors can't figure out why because his mom was a crack addict and an alcoholic. A uh, cute little guy has strawberry hair in the message. Called him up. Pastor, let me tell you what my wife said. Boy, red hair, Christopher David. He says, ah, the older I get, the more the voice of my wife sounds like the voice of the Holy Spirit. Um, you better get down here. Here's our attorney. Call him up. Here's the foster mom that's taking care of the baby. Call her up. So I called the attorney to do the legal work. 
Um, my wife calls a foster mom. Foster mom says, what are you going to name this baby boy? She says, Christopher David. Line goes quiet. Well, what's the matter? Well, last night we were by driving the baby home from the hospital and my three-year-old grandson sitting next to him in a car seat from out of nowhere. He says, Grandma, we should name this baby Christopher David. Hmm. How do you say no to that? You know, Christopher David is 23 now. No more red hair. He's brown. And so uh, Richard Shakarian, remember him? Calls me up, you know, we had a meeting in L.A. one day, calls me up and says, would you come speak to our regional conference? The last time I spoke the full gospel. So I go and I tell that story. Afterwards, these two guys come up. Uh, John Smoke from Oklahoma, and I forget the other guy's name, but the other guy was an attorney from Hood River, Oregon. You know, we got to talk, we chatted, left. Two years later, I get emails from this attorney in Hood River, Oregon. Oh, hi, Steve. You remember me? I met you at the Full Gospel Regional Meeting. Um, I've got a woman in my church who got pregnant with her son's foster kid, and she's come to the pastor and repented and, you know, wants to put her baby in an adoptive home because she's trying to save her marriage and knows she couldn't raise this child and save her marriage. Your name keeps coming up. Are you, will you take this child? And I said, you know, we promised God after Chris... I promise the Lord you will never have to drag me kicking and screaming again. Because all the rest of them, I was doing it because it was my life's passion and I was there to, and those kids, fabulous kids. And, but with the first seven, uh, we went through hell. I mean, those kids did everything but commit murder or suicide. I mean, drugs, rehab, alcohol, babies out of wedlock, juvenile detention, you know, uh, lawyers suing us for parental right. I mean, you name it. We went through hell. And, I mean, they're just fighting with the generational junk that came from where they came from. Uh, by the grace of God, all 11 of them still alive, um, on the right track, pointed in the right direction, different stages. Uh, one of them called me the other day, or sent me a text, Spokane, Washington. This kid was addicted to every drug there is, living under an overpass. Got kicked out of the shelter for carrying a concealed weapon. So, Dad, I went into the chapel at the Salvation Army and told the Lord that if he would deliver me from them stuff, this stuff, I'd never take drugs again. Walked out the next day totally free, no, mm. you know, no rehab, no side effects, no withdrawals, you know, uh, just, just had a baby boy. We're having a FaceTime tomorrow, or Monday. Um, total, you know, totally turned around life. And so all of them are just kind of, but, but the last two, uh, were like the rewards. They watched what all the other kids did. I mean, we had the cops in our driveway three times a week. I mean, every week. Had to. And they watched what the other ones did, and they learned what not to do. Yeah. And, I mean, they, they, they did awesome. But now, little by little, you know, every single one of them, they're just kind of turning around. Mm. They're turning around. But it's just, it's the Lord. I mean, it, it's the Lord... And um, he knows what everyone needs. And when you don't know how to pray, you just pray in the Spirit, and he prays it through you. And when you don't know how to pray, if you do know how to pray, what to pray, then you're probably wrong. <laughs> because, because his ways are higher than our ways. So, and I mean, if, he, if we had more time, I could tell you thousands of miracles that he did. Thousands of miracles. I'll tell you, I'll leave you with one. So we had one little girl, we, we got adopted her at five months old, twin girls. And as she grew up, she had um, lots of challenges, I mean, lots of challenges. Got to teen years, did everything wrong. And, um, you know, running away, self-harm to herself, you know, drugs, you know, sex, everything. And so... Um, fired her therapist three times, and in Washington State, where we lived then, a 13-year-old can get an abortion without parental permission, fire their therapist, 
because the kid has rights at 13. But the parent is responsible for up to $5,000 of damage that they do until they're 18. So every time they run, you got to call the cops and get a police report. Or else, if they crash somebody's car or break somebody's window, you're going to pay for it. And then the cops go find the kid, bring him home, and then they investigate you for being a molester and abuser. And then tell you all the programs you could go to. Oh, we've already been to all those programs. Oh, well, then just take them over the state line into Utah, and there's guys in black suits that you can call them. They'll come pick them up and take them to one of these teen camps. And we couldn't afford that. Because we already sent three to Military Academy in Chatham, Virginia, and three more to $3,500 a month per child reality attack therapy wilderness camp in Montana. <laughs> you name it. You name it. So uh, this little girl, one day, it's um, she's 17, the twin sister, they're late for school, brother's driving to school. The twin sister gets in the shotgun passenger side on the um, side of the um, car, and then they start having an argument over, I wanted to sit, that was my seat, you took my seat. And she gets angry and breaks a window and breaks one of my wife's china cups that her mother gave her and takes the shard from the cups and starts cutting her wrist. Um, so we call the police, and we got the, you know, all, they, the cops all knew us. I mean, they were our friends. They came every week. Um, and we got the one good cop that was in his 50s and was a real cop, and, you know, so he puts her in cuffs and takes her in and charges her for malicious mischief and property destruction. And I'm saying, thank God we can finally get a court order so that she has to take care of yeah. Thank God. And so we get there, I'm in there, you know, you know, Your Honor, uh, this child, you know, it, you know, fired her, th fired her therapist three times, she needs help. You know, she keeps, she won't go to the therapist. Well, you're out of, sir, you're, you're, you're out of order. Well, that we really need this. Well, sir, you're out of order. If you do this again, you're in contempt. I'm sorry, your honor. This child needs help. Okay, put it in the court order. She has to have a psych eval. So I go and I pick her up from juvenile detention three days a week, take her to the psych eval, um, finish the psych eval, and the psychiatrist says, well, she has three diagnoses, but I can't tell you what they are because she has rights, and you're just her parent. <laughs> Can't tell you what they are. So she goes back to jail, and the warden calls me and says, well, she's finished her sentence. It's time for you to come pick her up. I said, I'm not picking her up. Well, you have to pick her up. No, I don't. I'm not picking her up. Well, you have to, I'm not picking her up. The child sleeps with a steak knife under her pillow. She's jumped out of the car going, you know, full speed down the road. Uh, we have younger children in the home. I'm not going to be responsible for that. I'm not picking her up. She has a court order for therapy. I'm not picking her up. Well, we'll just send her to the youth hostel then. So youth hostel calls me up and says, um, if we have your daughter here. Uh, we need you to um, sign this release so that she can go on walks you know, out, out at night, and I mean, the youth hostel is in the worst neighborhood, you know, crime-ridden neighborhood, and you're going to send this psychologically disturbed, attractive, promiscuous 17-year-old out on the street by herself. No way. I'm not signing that. Well, you have to sign. No, I don't have to sign it. I'm not signing it. Well, we're just going to call a, <coughs> I forget what they call it. It's a meeting where all of the big dogs come together, so they have the, the social worker and the case worker and the Department of Social Services and the government here and the two attorneys that are representing the kid, the court of corner attorneys. And so these two attorneys, one of them is a big, tall guy, strong, and the other one is a shorter woman from India. She speaks with an Indian accent. And, uh, you know, we get in the room and this guy starts calling us monsters and beasts and I can't believe the state would even give you children like this because the kid has told him all these lies. And he believed her of how horrible we were. And it, I mean, I mean, we got real bad, real hard rules. I mean, our house has three rules: no drugs or alcohol. Be home on curfew when you say you're going to be home. 
and no steak knives under your pillow. <laughs> under your pillow. She couldn't keep them, so, you know, we're beasts. So anyway, so, so he starts assaulting me, stands up, wants me to go outside with him and, and brawl. And I mean, so my wife's got her finger in the belt loop on my jeans. <laughs> Don't you go out there with that guy. You know, and so anyway, just calling me all kinds of names. And then the other woman, the Indian woman, who's the attorney, she gets in between us, and she settles him down, and he gets taken off the case. Well, you know, we want you to sign this release. I'm not signing the release. So anyway, the attorneys go and find this other attorney, you know, and they're all state-appointed, court-appointed attorneys to represent the kid. And in order to represent the kid, they demonize the parents and the family. And so you're going to love this part. So anyway, they get this other attorney, and they find that in Washington State, they have a law that's called a dependency, which is designed to separate abused children from abusive parents. But there's a dependency A, a tendency, dependency B, a dependency C. The dependency C is anybody can file it for any reason whatsoever just because they want to. So they take that, and they file a dependency C. We get these court documents against us. And you have to appear at this hearing, and they don't even have a judge. It's a commissioner, a woman that puts on a robe and thinks she's God. And, and you can't take your attorney, and you have to have the court-appointed attorney. And the court-appointed attorney are these two kids that just got out of law school, and they don't know nothing. They don't know anything. And, um, and the system is designed for separating abusive parents from abusive kids. And we're the first case they've ever seen of a kid that wants to separate herself from who she says are abusive parents because she doesn't want to keep those three rules. You know, she wants to do whatever she wants to do whenever she wants to do it, take drugs, run around, not come home on time, and sleep with a steak knife under her pillow. And so, and who knows what she could do with a steak knife. So, uh, they sue us, and the judge says, well, you have to sign this. I'm not signing anything, Your Honor. You know, I, I don't, you, you didn't give me my, my, I want my own attorney. These guys are nice, but they don't know how to represent me. I'm not going to do that. Well, you have to, no, I'm not. Well, I'll hold you in contempt. Well, then hold me in contempt. I'm not going to do that. Um, oh, well, then we'll continue the case. So I'm praying, God, what do I do? What do I do? Just praying, 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 praying. And I get this little idea. Call social services. So I went all the way to the top, and I called the director, the state director of social services, and I told her what's happening. You know what she says? Steve, I understand what you're talking about. They're doing the same thing to me with my foster son. Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ. I know exactly what you're talking about. You need to call our attorney general. I'll give you her personal number. You call her up. You tell her what's happening to you and then listen to what she has to say. So I called the Attorney General who represents the whole State Department of Social and Health Services, and she says, I understand exactly what you're going on, going through because they're going through Judy, you know, because Judy, they're doing the same thing to Judy's foster son. <laughs> she says, you need to call this attorney right now and you need to retain him. You need to retain him because he will help you and if you don't retain him, these people will ruin your life. You will be labeled as a child molester for life, even though you are innocent, you didn't do anything, and you won't even be able to volunteer to take care of your grandchildren in school in the church nursery. And so, you know, so I call him up, really smart guy, um, Microsoft divorce attorney, thousand dollars an hour or so. And I tell him what happened and he says, really? And I said, yes, yeah. he says, who's the public defender that's handling? He says, and I told him his name, he says, oh, that SLB, he tries this garbage all the time. And he didn't say garbage, he said something worse. He tries this all the time. He says, you need to retain me. He says, most of my clients, I charge $1,000 an hour, but you just need to send me 400 bucks and I'll take care of this for you. <laughs> send me a check for 400 bucks, I'll take care of this. Um, so I sent him a check for 400 bucks. He goes and cuts a deal with the attorney general who he knows with the public defender that's representing the kid because all they want is money from the state so that she can go live in a foster home and get away from us and you know and get paid for whatever she wants to get paid. They just want money. And so he cuts a deal and they all agree they'll give her the money and you know put her in the foster home. And so it's over with and he attorney calls me up and says, okay, you need to fire me now. 
I said, why? He says, there's only one more hearing. You don't need to pay me. You can do it yourself. Just fire me. You know, I, you don't, I'm not going to charge him. <laughs> he says, just fire me. Okay, you're fired. So I'm with the client in Southern California in the desert, Mojave Desert, 10 o'clock at night. I opened my email. Here's this email from this public defender again. And he's put all of these 50 pages of lies back into the court document. And he sends me the email three days after I have a chance to respond to it. Three days after. So, you know, I forwarded on to my new attorney that I just fired. And he sends me back. <laughs> oh, that SOB, he's trying it again. <laughs> he's trying it again. You know, you need to hire me again. Send me another 200 bucks. I'll, ta I'll take care of this. And they took care of it. He took care of it, got everything cleansed off the record, uh, never got to the record. They put the girl in a foster home. She got kicked out of the foster home two weeks later for putting a state knife under her. You know, even, and even though the court order said mandated therapy, I think she went once. But just praise God you don't live in a state that thinks kids' rights at 13 are more important than, than parents who had the responsibility to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. But I, what I would say is, child's still alive, hasn't spoken to me in, since then, because she thinks I'm the bad guy, because you know I left her in jail. Um, but God is good, and when they're still alive, there's still an opportunity for the grace of God to manifest, and it will. It will. Mm. Just a matter of time. Anyway, that's my story. Will you close in the plan of salvation? Oh, okay. So what I would say to everybody that's watching the video is if, if, you, don't, if you don't hear the voice of Jesus, you are in trouble. <laughs> You're in trouble. You need, you need to hear the voice of Jesus. And it, it, all you need to do to hear the voice of Jesus is, is do what he said that, to do to accept who he was, that he's the son of God. He came from heaven. He died for us and suffered for us so we wouldn't have to go through everything that I went through when I didn't know that he would rescue me. Uh, and um, just acknowledge that he did it. Believe it in your heart that it's true and say it. That, you know, Jesus, your Lord, that means, you know, you're going to be my boss. That was when I said, you know, any, even the mud hut would be better be, would be better than <laughs> better than this because he doesn't have a mud hut for you. He's got something great. He's got a plan beyond anything you could ask, think, or even imagine. And when he said, "My sheep hear my voice," once you become a sheep, and you know what you need to do, you just need to believe who he is and what he said was true, and you need to say it. You know, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. You're my Lord, and mean it. Say it and mean it. It's that simple, because that's the way spiritual laws work. I mean, you believe in your heart and you say with your mouth. You believe it and you say it, and the, it, the promises of God are voice activated. How about that? 2021 language, 2022 language. The promises of God are voice activated. You know, when you believe them and you say them, then God brings them to pass. And so, uh, and one of the promises of God is that my sheep hear my voice, the voice of a stranger they shall not follow. And if you're alive on this planet today, you really need to hear what he's saying to you. Uh, and it doesn't. And, and when, when he's saying, and he's saying lots through lots of people, and and then sometimes directly into your heart, uh, you can't hear him until you're a sheep. So you need to be a sheep. And then if you're a sheep and you're listening to this and you don't hear it, it's just because you don't believe that what he said was true. So it's that simple. Just believe it and say it. You know, every time you need to hear from God. Lord, you said, I'm your sheep, I hear your voice. The voice of a stranger I wouldn't follow. Mm. Stop looking for doors to open and doors to close and putting fleeces out. That's just unbelief and doubt. I mean, this is a New Testament God. All you need to do is ask and listen. And the still, small voice will talk to you just like it did to me. Hopefully, it won't laugh at you. <laughs> he won't laugh at you like he did to me. Love you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Oh.